Hani Buzhu, hello. I'm Sarah Medanik, the president and CEO of the Gore Downey and Chani Bunjak Fund. And thank you all for joining us today for the fireside chat. And, you know, as uh, much as we can have a Zoom-esque fire, um, but more importantly, for joining us to discuss the inaugural National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Before we jump into things, I'd like to get us started in a good way by acknowledging that folks are tuning in from coast to coast to coast. I'd like to encourage folks to take a moment to consider the traditional territories of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people in which you may be tuning in from today. As we are all on the journey of reconciliation together, please take this time as a moment to acknowledge, pay respect, and think about our relationship to the land, animals, creatures, water, and people with whom we engage with on a daily basis. At a national level, we are all treaty people and through our shared history, we wish to acknowledge our relationship in that manner while taking a moment to pay our respects to each other. And I would like to pay both respect and gratitude to all of our panelists for sharing their time and knowledge with us today. And to all of you for tuning in, please send along questions and comments to our socials. We will be replying, um, even though this isn't uh, a live uh, chat today, uh, please feel free to engage with us and we will get right back to you. So to get us started, I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to introduce themselves and help provide context for our viewers today about the important work each one of us does to further reconciliation every day. Bob, as the chair of the Danny Benjack board, why don't you get us started? Great, uh, thanks, Sarah. Bonjour. Ani uh, Sego, everybody. Kanoshiwake Magazine, Indigenous Makododam. So, my name is Bob. Um, I'm here at Six Nations Reserve in southwestern Ontario and really happy to be part of this. Uh, as Sarah noted, I'm the chair of the Downing Windjack Fund. Also, I'm a prof at uh, Queen's University, where I teach a course on reconciliation and have been involved in these issues and uh, furthering reconciliation and the um, and, and Indigenous knowledge in all of its forms for a number of years. And looking forward to this fireside chat. Miigwech nyan. Hi, thank you for having me in today. Uh, my name is Blair Cunningham. I sit on the board of directors for the Orange Shirt Society. Um, I am located right now in the traditional territories of Treaty 7 uh, in Calgary, Alberta. Um, I sit on the Orange Shirt Society, as I said. Um, I am the only board member that is out of province. Um, our society is out of Williams Lake, uh, British Columbia. Um, and the ambassador and founder of Orange Shirt Day, Phyllis Webstad, um, started this movement in 2013. Um, so we will be acknowledging the 10th anniversary in 2023. Um, so thanks for having me here today. Anin Bojo, Api Baba Nagigakwe, Gimibso Shanodankwe, Hillary Indigenikas, Naya Shingamin and Donjaba, Ottawa and Dodam, Nagig Dodam. Hi, hello, my name is Hillary. Um, I'm originally from the Chippewas and Nawash First Nation, part of the Saugeen and Ojibwe Nation Territory on Naya Shingamin otherwise known as Cape Croker in the beautiful Georgian Bay, Bruce Peninsula. Uh, Bruce Peninsula. Um, I am residing here in Algonquin Unceded Territory and I am the Interim Executive Director for Canadian Roots Exchange. Um, CRE, we're an Indigenous youth-led organization um, focusing on providing pathways for Indigenous youth um, to find opportunities in their resiliency and self-determination um, and provide, and, helping them find or achieving reconciliation in their lifetime, more or less. Um, and so we do this through a number of ways, through capacity building, um, solidarity, networking, and culturally vitalization. Um, the topic of reconciliation is one that we talk about quite a bit. Um, our organization has been so beneficial to have received funding regarding Call to Action 66. So we're currently a bit of a pilot right now to see how we can implement that better. Um, and so I'm excited to be here. Um, I always love an opportunity to have a chat and I'm actually very honored to be here with um, all these other speakers and so happy to learn and engage. So miigwech. 
Uju Harriet Visitor, Nindish Nakaz, Makwen Dondem, Sulakaut and Dondeba. My name is Harriet Visitor. I live in Sulakaut, so I am living on the traditional territory of the Obishkakon Anishinaabek, also known as Black Sioux First Nation Treaty 3. And I am a uh, board member of the Downey Winjack Fund. I sit on the fund as a liaison for my mother and her sisters. I am the niece of my uncle Cheney Winjack. And I really look forward to uh, for being and sitting here with, with you all as well. Miigwech. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I wanted to help provide a bit of context around both uh, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and Orange Shirt Day to help set the foundation for our discussion today. So the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, in June, the federal government announced the creation of a new statutory holiday known as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation to be recognized on September 30th each year. This day fulfills the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 80 which was, we call upon the federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples to establish as a statutory holiday, a national day for truth and reconciliation to honor survivors, their families and communities and ensure that public commemoration of the history and legacy of residential schools remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. The day is intended to serve as a day of remembrance, reflection, action and learning it also already has momentum around it with the within the reconciliation movement itself because of Orange Shirt Day. So uh, Blair, you know better than most um, about the work of the Orange Shirt Society. Um, but since uh, 2013, September 30th has been known as Orange Shirt Day, a day to recognize the true history and longstanding effects of residential schools. Um, what is Orange Shirt Day? In 1973, at the age of six, Phyllis West's dad was sent to residential school. Her grandmother bought her a brand new orange shirt to wear on her first day. But when she arrived at the mission school, she was stripped and her clothes were taken, including the orange shirt. So on September 30th, we wear orange to remember Phyllis's story and the 150,000 indigenous children like her who were taken from their families, communities, and cultures. Uh, Blair, do you want to pop in there for a sec? Okay, um, so uh, thanks for that. Um, yes, the first day um, that was recognized as Orange Shirt Day was September 30th, uh, 2013. Um, and it was a movement that Phyllis and the organization from Williams Lake never thought that it would grow to be as huge and as big as it is now today. It sort of took a life of its own. Um, which is great to see. Um, it's all about remembering those kids that didn't make it home, remembering their survivors and listening to their truths and walking with them as they go on their healing journeys as well. Um, so we look forward to educating people and keeping them informed moving forward. So we received a number of questions for our panelists today. So let's uh, jump right in and start with the big one. Um, the federal government announced the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation as a federal statutory holiday. However, this means that not all communities, businesses, organizations, and individuals can recognize the day in the same way because it's up to each province to decide how it's recognized. For example, federal employees will recognize this day as a paid holiday. Certain provinces like Manitoba are closing their schools while well, some provinces are leaving the implementation of a statutory holiday up to individual employers. How does this impact the way we honor the intention of this day? And what do you think is the best way for Canadians to recognize the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? So I'll, I'll start off. Um, you know, the first part of the question is, should this be a holiday for everybody? I, I think it should. And, and I think that you know, this is going to be the first time that we celebrate it as a statutory holiday. Um, some people have said, well, is it just like, a, is it just purely some symbolic thing? Or is this going to be something real? 
And, and I, I think it's up to all of us to determine whether it's something symbolic or something real. What is it that all of us as people living in this country can put into September 30th to make it meaningful for ourselves and for our families, our communities, but significantly for residential school survivors, their families and their communities. I think government's given us, you know, a bit of a place to be able to operate within, but it's up to us to walk through those doors and give meaning to it uh, in the very best way we can. It would be great if it, there was something ceremonial like Remembrance Day. Maybe next year we'll have that, but let's put our energies into making this something more than, than a day off for a few people. I am. Um... I totally agree with Bob. I really feel that this should be a statutory holiday for everybody. Um, I really do not like the word celebrate. Um, I think it should be a commemoration um, day. Uh, just because it's not, in my opinion, I don't think it's something that we should celebrate. Um, we are talking about the traumas that so many people have gone through and then losing so many of the kids in these schools as well. Um, but being able to commemorate them and honor them in our traditional ways, um, I think that would be the proper way to do this. Um, whether it's with cities, but even with cities and towns, making sure that we get input from all of the Indigenous people around um, so that they have their say into what the day should look like as well when we move forward and do these commemoration events. Um, and so that everybody can participate and learn and educate um, and learning those truths from our survivors. Um, in 50 years, those survivors aren't gonna be around. So we need to get their stories and listen to them and help them on their healing journeys um, so that we can help their family members out as well. I also agree with you in that I would have liked to have seen this as a recognized statutory holiday. As an educator, I would have liked to have seen this happen. And I also have um, issues with the, the word celebrate. And like you, I think of commemorate or recognize or even acknowledge is, um, you know, this is an, our, our opportunity to, um, to be able to do that. When I think of myself and you know, I've said that, you know, I was born, I was born with this, I was born into this um, brokenness. I was born um, into all the intergenerational impacts. And through now to this day, I, I'm, I'm, you know, working at undoing and changing a lot of that in myself and in, in my children and recognizing that my children are equally born into this as well. And my responsibility to, to that and to acknowledge and recognize that and understand that, you know, we were all born into this. And to see or to have seen it being recognized by our government would have meant a lot, would have meant that they are acknowledging or recognizing or seeing the impacts that we live with and still live with to this day. Yeah, I'll just like echo to all of those points as well. Like I, I completely agree. And I think the right words to use is around commemorating. And, you know, we've come a really long way in the sense that, you know, I've been doing this work for a really long time too, right? And I think that, you know, I remember having to, you know, find, it would be like the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was like the only thing in the library that I could find that I even spoke to this, right? And so, you know, it there it's so much more, I think, available and in our face. And I think that's a really good thing because I think it's really good for this awareness for others to know. But I also want to ensure that the way in which we approach, the, approach this is met with cultural safety and sensitivity and intention um, so that it isn't this, oh, well, we commemorated for this one day, we're good now, you know? And it's like, it's a long standing, it's a lot of work, it's continuous work. And I think it's just really important that the day is met with the right intention. And um, to echo your point too, Blair, um, I, I really do believe that where you're located and how we're, sorry, commemorating this day 
it needs to be led in consultation with the indigenous community of the territory in which you occupy, right? I think that is a really key piece to these conversations around reconciliation and settler awareness of, you know, where you reside and sort of what those impacts are and uh, especially around bigger conversations of cultural safety too for indigenous kin. So I'll just leave it at that, but. I think it might be important to maybe just touch on in consultation with not necessarily led by. I think we really need to be cognizant of putting the onus back on indigenous peoples and communities to be responsible for this day. Um, I know even in the language around the announcement itself, you know, calling it a holiday. It's not a holiday, it's a day for, you know, reflection. And, you know, Shauna from Toronto sent in a question that says, how does a stat holiday help reconciliation? Everyone will be home instead of out learning the truth. So how can we create those opportunities or facilitate those opportunities for the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation to be a day of reflection and education and healing? Um, if I may, actually, um, I, that one, I think that's a really interesting question. It's a good question. Um, but I think when we look at learning about reconciliation and challenging your own sort of settler privilege and positionality, it doesn't operate in a vacuum. So it's not one day, it's, it is a lifelong journey, right? And so we also have this thing, this magic but scary tool called the internet and everything is at your fingertips at this point, right? And so I, I get that question a lot, like how do I continue my journey? How do I continue this learning and furthering it? And there is just so much out there that's readily available, right? I mean, you look at the orangeshirtday.org, right? There's a ton of work out there. Um, there's, so I know with our uh, organization, we're constantly putting out information and resource and tools because I think that was something that was uh, concerning to a lot of folks. And Harriet, I believe you touched on that too, was, you know, especially with education, how are we supposed to get that information out and start providing the appropriate resources and tools for younger generations to come to really learn about it. And there's a ton of stuff out there. And I really just think it takes the onus on um, non-Indigenous like settlers in this country to really go ahead and find, that, find those resources, but they're readily available. I assume we can plug them in the chat later and send a list of resources. I have plenty, um, but the journey doesn't start here. Hey, on the um, site as well. So if folks you know, they don't know where to start, they don't know how to take that first step, um, visit our website at downybunjack.ca and we can help with those, uh, with those launching points. I think one of the things that would be helpful for us to just have a, a quick chat around, and maybe this is a good question for Bob, why has this national day just been created now? Wasn't this a TRC call to action in 2016? You know, will the announcement of this day be enough to further reconciliation? Is it going to look like, okay, we created the day, now we're done? What can we do to ensure that this is an ongoing commitment? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I, I think that that's a great question. You know, I think back even further to 2008, when then Prime Minister Stephen Harper was giving his apology. And one of the things he talked about was that residential school survivors and their families and communities have carried this burden for far too long. And it was time for Canada to carry its share. And, and, and I think that we've had this real void in terms of Canada stepping up to the plate and, and doing its, its job. Um, you know, I know there's some that talk about this holiday as being, you know, maybe uh, performative rather than something that's substantive. Um, I, I tend to sort of fall into the place of, you know, let's give it a try. Let's, let's make this substantive. There's things that we can all do to breathe life into this and to breathe good energy into this in a really respectful way. Uh, I'm mindful of what others have said too about, you know, consistent with what the TRC said. This is a responsibility and an opportunity for all of Canada. It's not a burden on Indigenous people to carry reconciliation to everybody's doorstep. 
it's time for Canada and for Canadians more generally to step up to the plate, do, the, do this hard work of being an ally and being part of decolonization and being part of this respectful journey of reconciliation. Absolutely. So Blair, maybe you might be the best one to speak to this question. Uh, how does the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation uh, fit with Orange Shirt Day? Does it replace the Orange Shirt Day movement? Does it integrate into Orange Shirt Day? How, how do we ensure that the movements are complementary? And should folks wear orange shirts on September 30th? Thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, honestly, I really think they're going to complement each other. Um, I can't see Orange Shirt Day ever going away. Um, the acknowledgement of it just from Canadians and not only Canadians, this has gone internationally uh, to the States. We're getting emails all the time at the Society from other countries as well, New Zealand, Australia, um, in regards to Orange Shirt Day and where they can actually get orange shirts. So the movement itself isn't going to go away. I think they're going to complement each other. Reconciliation isn't going to happen overnight. It's something that's going to take years and years to get. Um, and with that being said, the Orange Shirt Day movement and hearing the stories from all of our survivors and all the family members that lost individuals that never made it home, those stories are going to live on um, going forward as well. It's the truths that have been hidden so long in our history, but now they are actually going to be in history books. Um, a lot of this information um, that is coming out, people are writing their own stories. Uh, they're writing their own books. Um, there's a number of different uh, stories that were made into movies as well that people can look at and get some of the information from as well. Um, as well as checking out the orangeshirtday.org website and finding out Phyllis's story as well. Uh, that's a great beginning. And she's got curriculum as well made for kids as young as four years old going through the group. So um, a couple of her books that she does have. So this one here actually is for kids four to six years old. Um, she has another one, this one here, the Orange Shirt Day, um, that one there is for the higher grades. So up to, I think it's grade eight or grade nine. And then she just put out another one that came out on September 1st beyond the Orange Shirt Day. And that book there talks about her, um, the multi-generations of her family that went to residential schools. So um, they made it into curriculum so that it can be taught in schools as well. Um, so I know that like Remembrance Day, we were all taught at a young age what it was about before the day even happened. So I can see that happening with the Orange Shirt Day as well and what the, um, the national holiday is standing for now. And just a very practical application. So what should you do if you know your school or community or place of employment doesn't recognize Orange Shirt Day, um, isn't recognizing the national day of truth and reconciliation what if it's just business as usual september 30th do you have recommendations on what i as an individual could do in that situation uh thanks again so in that situation what we recommend to individuals is talk to your workplace see if they can get people to wear an orange shirt if they're not allowing you to wear an orange shirt Wearing something as simple as a little button like this will show your support as well. Wearing an orange scarf, it doesn't have to be a t-shirt, anything orange will show that you're supporting that day. Um, there are a lot of events that are taking place in the evening as well that you can participate. Or if you work in the evenings, there's daytime things that you can participate in. Um, right now, due to COVID, there's a lot of online live streaming happening. Um, my place of employment, the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, we are doing a live stream that is open to everybody as well. And we have um, Chief uh, Vincent Yellowwold woman talking about his lived experience at residential schools. So there's a number of different ways that you can access um, 
this information and participate. Like I said, simple as wearing an orange button or an orange scarf. Um, a lot of people have homemade orange uh, earrings. You know, you're showing support that way as well. Hillary, a lot of the work that you do is around connecting Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth on the journey towards reconciliation. Uh, I'm sure you've been receiving this question a lot. We, um, we've been receiving it a lot at the Downey Wen Jack Fund uh, from folks asking what they can do to commemorate the day. As non-Indigenous people or allies, um, what suggestions or ideas um, can you offer that will help people in Canada to make this day uh, respectful and constructive? Right, and that's that's an excellent question, and I kind of have a long-winded way of answering it. I think before we even get into that, there's so many, we need to really enter the discussion about different forms of allyship, right? And so when you look at the good intention that goes into showing up for your Indigenous friends, colleagues, family members, etc., we really need to sort of break down a little bit of how that works and what is the most appropriate way. So we often see these, actually, I'll give a really great example of some of the allyship that I wanna talk about. And it's a teaching that was given to me from a, a friend of mine who is Maori. And this person was watching a butterfly become crystallized. And as they're watching this process over day after day, they started to notice and see that the butterfly was struggling a bit. So the person ended up poking a little hole in the crystallization to allow for the butterfly to come out. Once the butterfly emerged, the butterfly was actually injured and actually didn't really allow for the natural process for the butterfly to flourish. You know, was it the person's intention to do that? No. Was harm caused? Yes. So what I'm trying to use by that is there are these other complexities around white saviorism, um, a little bit of entitlement, and we have to, there's this delicate dance between are we appropriating or are we appreciating and ensuring that we're not tokenizing, right? Um, so I think, as I mentioned before too, you know, learning about reconciliation just doesn't operate in this vacuum. And there's so many little tangible things that you can do, not just on that day, but every single day. Um, again, donating to indigenous organizations, you know, like the Downey Wenjack Fund, like, you know, CRE, there's so many organizations, grassroots organizations that are doing real reconciliation work. Um, I, you know, there's four R's, A7G, Pactuit, you know, women, like we see there's so many out there and we often provide a lot of resources on our website to do that. I think as settlers, it is also your responsibility to create space for indigenous voices, right? And so some of those pieces are using your privilege to able to speak out to MPs. You know, when you see something happening in your community, um, you know, it is your responsibility to hold our MPs accountable to implementing the truth, uh, the TRC calls to action, right? I think resharing stories of resiliency and of celebration of the Indigenous community is really important too. So we're not just constantly operating in this deficit narrative. Um, another one that I really think is important is ensuring that you're resharing these stories where our children and our women go missing. You know, I see that a lot and I often see on my feed, it's Indigenous people that are resharing our stories, but it is your responsibility to, and of course, support Indigenous artistry, right? Like, I think these are little pieces that, you know, it's about us commemorating, you know, the legacy of genocide and violence that has been inflicted on Indigenous communities. But there's also this other piece too, because as resilient people, we are still here, but we still need support and we still need to have others, you know, by our side through this journey of allyship and like reconciliation. Hilary, you provided some great examples of, um, of what folks can do. Uh, we received a question uh, from Kathy asking, is it appropriate for me to ask my Indigenous friends what I could be doing to help bring about reconciliation. Can you uh, speak to that? I love this question. Um, so yes and no, but largely maybe, okay? So <laughs> and I'm gonna take you through this. Um, are they an educator? Then maybe, okay? If they're just an indigenous person that you happen to know, I'm gonna go with probably not, it's not a safe thing. 
Um, there is a lot of risk of tokenizing individuals. Um, and, you know, the responsibility, as we've already discussed, doesn't rest on your Indigenous friends, colleagues, and family members to be educating you about reconciliation and what you can do. Um, I think when I use the word, are we educators, this often is like the category that I kind of fit in. Sometimes, yes, I always think it's appropriate to go, do you have the space or the energy to share this with me? And try and think of ways in which you give me reciprocal. So here's another reason why I say kind of maybe largely on the no side. Um, so for me as an Indigenous person, and I'm only speaking from my perspective in this case, um, if I were to define my relationship with reconciliation on Facebook, it would be, it's complicated. Um, depending on the news cycle, a hot mess. Um, but largely, more than anything, you know what, I'm going to stick it out for the kids, you know, because I truly do believe that we do have an opportunity to create reconciliation within this country. And that is a lot of the work that we do as Indigenous people. But we also end up really carrying this work. I have a colleague of mine that has this beautiful line, you know, and it's hard work that we do in this field of reconciliation, but it's hard work. And it's my blood work, you know, this is for my family, this is for my community, this is for my kin. So it's really difficult for us as Indigenous people a lot of the time around this word reconciliation and the complicatedness around it. Um, we largely hear this word somewhat bastardized within public discourse and political rhetoric, and it tends to be a bit of a shield from time to time for failures, um, for systemic failures for, uh, that causes a lot of harm towards Indigenous people. The other part about it is so many of our teachings are really based on community love and respect. And so what happens when that's not reciprocated? We start to really lose a little of that hope. And I feel as though so often than not, when we are forced or asked to be part of these conversations around reconciliation, around providing settler folks an opportunity to build a guidance of where to go, there is a little bit of that safety element that needs to be reciprocated and understanding that it's taking a lot of energy. Um, I've said this before in the past, but all of these stories, especially what has been happening in the last five months about the recovery of the bodies, these are stories we have known for so long. These are stories that have been told by time and time again, passed down from generation. So to hear you know, the shock and awe of a lot of our settler counterparts that was really hard to hear too. So it's really being mindful about how you're entering those discussions. But I would say large err on the side of caution, maybe just try, do a little Googling first. I'll leave it at that, miigwech. No, I really love, um, I love that concept of, you know, asking first if there's space and capacity. You know, there is no harm in asking questions when they're done with heart and intention and with the consideration of the other person on the other side of that question. So that's something I think that's uh, really important to be mindful of is, you know, if it feels off, it probably is. So it never hurts to ask. Um, I, got a, I got an excellent question that I've been saving uh, for Harriet from our friend Mark from Mississauga, he asked, why is it important for Canadians to give space, stop and listen on September 30th? When I listen or when I see this question, it takes me back to the summer in May, June in the summer when the, the bodies of children were found at different residential schools and the numbers are rising. And it made me think of July 1st and everything leading up until July 1st, I had the uh, Ministry of Education um, ask me, what, 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 how can I speak to Canada Day? And uh, it made me think about how leading up to that, everyone was, you know, it was about Canadians and I thought, you know, defining or redefining what it means to be Canadian for them and having to look at themselves honestly in terms of what they were seeing in the news. And like um, Hillary said, 
these children, um, the stories have been coming out for decades. And if, you know, for a long time about these missing children that are, are, uh, were, not, were not found. And it made me think about how coming up to July 1st and you begin to look at what was happening globally in terms of everyone um, answering that question for themselves. We've had other countries questioning um, that um, definition as well and wanting to be part of the discussion. I think about um, how you would see First Nation communities um, not wanting to acknowledge or recognize that day and with um, good reason not to, not to want to. So it was a time I see for Canadians and this is a, a great time for them to give space, to stop and listen. And that's the thing, to, to acknowledge and show respect and that to be able to just sit and listen to what is being said and shared and the stories of our survivors. And, and I mean, this is, the bodies are, are still being found. We are not complete. We're not done finishing our story. And, you know, I think about right now and what I see, I seen something on the social media, a couple of my friends have shared where their children are not standing for the national anthem at school. They're choosing to sit. And so we have a younger generation, our children that are wanting their answers. They're asking these questions. They're wanting and their voices, they want their voices to be heard and their support to, for us to be supportive of them. And it just made, it really moved me to see these children that are, that are, that are standing for what they believe and not um, rising to the national anthem and, and uh, sitting down. So we have now children that are asking these questions across Canada and it's our responsibility to, um, to answer that and to recognize that um, younger and younger children are questioning and wanting answers. Yeah, I think you bring up a, a really poignant point. You know, this year, uh, many people wore their orange shirts on Canada Day, and many Canadians struggled with uh, how to acknowledge that day in a way that was mindful and respectful of Indigenous peoples and communities that were grieving. And I think that there is a bigger conversation to be had around that notion. And I, I'd like to open up this question um, to the whole panel around the future of Canada Day, of national identity, um, and how it's celebrated. And, you know, what is appropriate celebration or commemoration or reflection look like within the context of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? How do we start to reconcile these sort of conflicting feelings around national identity? So I was so happy to be in Scarborough with the uh, Canadian Tamil Congress and they were doing their annual walkathon. And, um, um, and part of that fundraiser, they were going to uh, make those funds available to the Downing Wimsack Fund. And it was a sea of orange in Scarborough at that park. They were asking, um, are, are we settlers? And, uh, and so I think there is this um, discomfort, this uncertainty about national identity. And, uh, and I said, yeah. He said, I, I think you're settlers. Does it mean you're colonists in the way that the British and the French um, have been? No. But when people arrive in this country, they benefit from the dispossession 
of lands from indigenous people. Uh, the genocide has been perpetrated against indigenous people. And I think part of this conversation that's been started since May is, is this reckoning that needs to happen in terms of national identity. Um, I've heard the elders talk a lot about this is, we got to do reckoning before we do reconciliation. And, and I think that's what these children have reminded us of, is that truth, truth is part of that. And maybe as a country, we've kind of rushed to reconciliation and we're being reminded, no, there's truth that still needs to come out and truth is going to be coming out for quite a while. And it's going to reshape how we think about each other uh, in this country, uh, what we celebrate, what we don't, what we commemorate, um, and, uh, uh, and what we look like in, you know, some people would say like in a post-colonial way or in a, what does settler colonization look like? I mean, there's all these things that we need to consider in terms of power sharing, um, um, different fiscal uh, initiatives that can be launched in terms of ensuring that our people aren't poor. And there's a lot of things that need to happen. And if you know, people have taken for granted that that's just part of sort of the construct of Canada is there's a lot of poor indigenous people. It doesn't have to be that way. Like let's make our identity something different than poverty in indigenous communities. Um, I just, I, I really appreciate those points. And I think there's like another larger discussion too around sort of these um, definitions around settler and sort of what that looks like. And I, I often, I remember being in an airport once with someone and we were talking about this and they were a settler and they just said, you know, that word really offends me. And I was like, oh, okay, like, let's talk about that. Like, why, why does that word offend you? You know, and they were just like, well, you know, I'm, I wasn't originally from here and I came here and I was like, okay, so did you settle here? <laughs> and, you know, it was one of those things like, you know, it, it, I think it's the way that it gets used, right? And I think it's your responsibility as a human, how you use that definition, right? I think settlers do have a responsibility in addition to like how indigenous people, we also have a responsibility, right? Like there's, it's a two way street. I think when we start looking at those identity pieces too, there's also another conversation that I know that we've been largely having at our organization is around this more aspect of solidarity within reconciliation. And we kind of speak to that point where we look at sort of, so what got us into this situation to begin with, right? And we can boil it down to as simple as white supremacy. That's really it at the end of the day. And I know that's an ugly word and I know it gets, it scares people, but it really is the truth of the matter. It's a racialized system that was put in place to eradicate indigenous populations. So there is this other larger shift that we're starting to see as solidarity and reconciling between other marginalized groups, you know, really examining the ties between black liberation and indigenous sovereignty, right? Like there are these things that are closely lined and looking at how these systems really have divided us as a country and as communities that have actually been at the end of violence at the same time. So I think it's really interesting that we have these discussions and we're having them now too. And I think it's really at the end of the day, how do we use those words? Words have so much power in them. And I think you can use that word as a settler, as a badge of honor to know that you uphold a responsibility of allyship and to do something really good with that. It doesn't have to be complacency. It doesn't have to be, you know, just sort of wondering what to do. There's a lot of reconciliation that can happen between this. So I think it's just a matter of sort of taking the effort and taking the time to also realize we're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. No one's gonna get it right the first time. We didn't get it right the first time. So here we are, we're trying again. And ultimately this is really just for the next seven generations and for our children and our youth to be able to thrive. Harriet, I love that story about the Canada Day and the youth sitting down like that just, I got goosebumps. You know, that's the hope that I like hearing about is that folks are speaking up and they're starting to see that change. So anyways, miigwech. For Canada Day, when I think about Canada Day, what I've seen happen this year um, 
in seeing with, within Northwestern Ontario, seeing how municipalities, how they were taking an active role in providing opportunities for their um, constituents or their members living within their towns to, instead of instead of recognizing Canada Day this way, we are going to um, offer um, and encourage you to learn more about the Indigenous people around in your areas and opportunities. I, you know, I and, and to see them do that within this area gave me a lot of hope, gave me a lot of hope to see that um, that hearts and minds are starting to be willing to change. And for me, that gives me hope. When I think about Canada Day, I had a student um, or I had a, someone say to me, you know, uh, my daughter says, so we're not going to celebrate Canada Day. And so having those really conversations with our children and with our youth, um, you know, it just leaves opportunity for that. And to understand that oftentimes I always say that I look through her lens, you know, um, through my daughter's eyes and, um, you know, hers are, she sees through her heart. She can't help but see people in the world through her heart where I'm a bit tainted in how I see things. But I'm always mindful of the story and my role as an educator and as a mother and as an aunt and as an Indigenous woman, how it's our responsibility to walk this journey with our, our children or our students and that they're going to continue our story. Our story that is one of pain, but one of resilience and strength. But to understand that, yes, our, our story is painful. But I know that when I look at them, I see that they're going to carry our story. And our why we're still strong and resilient is because I see you. You're here. So you show me that we are strong and resilient. And my responsibility is just to continue walking that with you until it's time for you to keep walking with someone else. Until my, my time, my role is done with you. And so I just, I think of that when I think about Canada. And... Um, Canada looking at itself and understanding that our history is your history. Our Indian in, Indian residential school history is your history. So that's what I think about when I'm thinking about um, Canada Day as well. Um, this last past uh, Canada Day in 2021, um, I know that there was a lot of municipalities and cities um, that chose not to celebrate Canada Day. Um, the city of Calgary did choose to celebrate Canada Day, um, but what they did is the first, before they got into their celebrations online, um, because everything was done online this year, before they did the fireworks, they actually did an educational piece on the Indigenous people um, and tried to share that piece there as well. So I can see going forward, a lot of communities doing that, adding that in, um, making sure that education piece in is about the Indigenous people, First Nation, Métis and Inuit, um, so that people know the truth. They know the history as told by the Indigenous people, not the truth setter um, or so-called truths that might be out there in the Hollywood films, right? Because we know those aren't truths. Um, so listening to the Indigenous people from the territories and the surrounding areas, a lot of communities, I think, going forward will start doing that to add that educational piece in for Canada Day so that, uh, you know, it is still probably going to be celebrated, but with that educational piece um, attached to it now. Thank you all for uh, really leaning in to that conversation. It's a, that's a tough that's a tough conversation that we need to continue to have um, as we exist together as Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in this country we call Canada. And so I, I really appreciate everyone uh, sharing with Hearts Forward. And Harriet, I, I really take your messages to heart about looking at, at, at the young ones as our future and seeing things through their eyes. And if we take that lens as we approach these conversations, 
I think it adds a level of heart and humility that we always need to carry with us when we talk about reconciliation and when we talk about you know, identity and what that means. They're, they're hard conversations, but they're ones that we need to not be afraid of and that we need to, to lean into together. Just in closing, I want to say something with that. When I was approached with that question, I really had to think about it. I had to think about it. I said, you know what? For the month of June, I teach on National Indigenous History Month. I do my nation to nation visiting and I love it. I love it. And I lead up into National Indigenous Peoples Day. So school's out by what, June 25? And I never really have ever taught what it means to be Canadian or to identify what Canada means and never thought about it because I'm, I'm just focused somewhere else. So it made me really think. And I said, you know what? I never really, I never really question that in myself when I self-identify I'm Oji Cree. So it made me really think about those questions. And if I were to create a lesson plan as an educator, what would I say? How knowing that I have my students looking at me, looking at me for answers, wanting to make sense of, and everything is about terminology. And I always say that, you know, I always look at terminology so important. So I never, it made me really think about, take it back and really think about that. What does it mean to be Canadian? And what does, what is Canada? So I really had to think about that. I'm not going to answer, but I really had to think about that. You know, I think that's such an important um, thing for us to all think about. And I invite everyone who's joining us today to listen into this panel, maybe take that away and, and consider what that means to you within your identity, within your community, uh, as an Indigenous or non-Indigenous person in this country. Um, I think these conversations are so important and I, I want to be uh, so respectful of everyone's time for joining us today, but I'm so grateful that we could um, share this time together uh, to talk about about what the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation means and how people can walk away from our panel today with maybe a few nuggets of knowledge or information or the next how-to or you know how with a greater sense of how to be respectful and mindful and really uh, to have a better sense of how to make a difference within their communities to support truth, healing, and ultimately to build a stronger society for all. Maybe a good way for us to, um, to part ways today would just be a, a couple thoughts on what we can do. You know, how, how can each of us make a difference within our communities to support reconciliation, to support the movement, to support the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? Um, I can go first. I think for me, one thing, one message I would want to make clear to like, especially Indigenous kin is, you know, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Um, again, you know, these last several months have been really intense and it's kind of in your face all the time. Every time you're on Instagram or Facebook, we're reminded of, you know, uh, where our, what our families have been through. So really take this time on that day because there's going to be a lot to take care of yourself. Um, you know, really trying to find those moments of wellness, um, trying to find as, you know, my, what we refer to as Minoba Madzawin, just really finding a way to really live that good life and, you know, take care of each other and take care of yourself and be gentle and be kind. Um, I guess I can go next. So uh, one thing that I think that people should take away from this is um, being really supportive, listening. Listening is huge. Um, listening to the stories from the survivors as well as from our elders. Um, listen to the kids. The kids have a lot of really good stories as well that they have learned along their short journeys that they've only just begun. Um, the other thing that I want to caution people about as well is um, there are so many people out there selling orange shirts and orange 
shirt day paraphernalia that are not Indigenous owned or the money's not going to an Indigenous organization. Um, a lot of the artwork has been stolen as well. So please, please, please check to make sure that it is coming from a valid source. I guess I'll go next. I can't help but think about Gord and the creation of our fund and remembering the first time, like I've, I've heard his music before, um, but I was coming uh, from the James Bay Highway into Valdor Amos and we had just checked into our hotel. My husband had said, let's turn on the TV so we can catch the last concert. Well, I turned it on and what I heard was his call that he did to the prime minister. And I just sat, I stood there listening to him. And the minute I heard him speak, I thought, who is this guy? I know who he is, but you know, I was wanting to know more. And he, listening to him made me feel that he acknowledged me. He acknowledged me as an indigenous person, indigenous woman, a mother, an educator. He acknowledged me. And in that acknowledgement, he showed respect. And so he, when I heard him speak that, I thought, okay, so now my, um, what I do is I, I carry Gore's heart. So he wanted to walk hand in hand with us. So that's what I do. I extend, I extend a hand. You wanna walk? I'll walk with you, I'll walk hand in hand with you because of what I've, because of what he did. So I, I, I think of Gord and how, you know, someone who, you know, really was moved and wanted to know and really want, was um, understood that there was so much lacking in, in what was taught to him and wanted to know so much and wanted to share it. And although, it's been shared, it's been shared before, you know? So I think of, um, I think of Gordon this and that, um, I'll walk hand in hand with you. If you'll walk with me, not in front of me, not behind me, you gotta walk beside me. So I think of him with this. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, former Governor General Mikhail Jean, her talking about truth and reconciliation, about, it's about confronting historical wrongs and going through that process that she said it was kind of like a re a refounding of uh, of canada and i think about that in terms of a really big picture the fact that at the time of confederation indigenous people weren't part of that the time of so many things that um, are important in terms of the way that canada articulates its story it's not inclusive of, of our story. And we're being reminded of that now and really reminded of that since, uh, since May. And I think about if there's one thing that can bind us all together, it's that idea that I think it doesn't matter where you come from, uh, who you are, most people want something better for their children and their grandchildren than what they've inherited. And that's something that we can all work with. How can we create that better future for our children and our grandchildren and all those coming faces? And the one test that I think about in this is what are the things that I could be doing and how, are, how am I doing those things? Would my grandkids be proud of those things? That's kind of the test that I think about. And, um, and maybe that's a bit like what uh, what Harriet was saying, sort of through the eyes of that uh, that child. Uh, maybe it's kind of the same thing. Are our kids going to be proud of uh, of what we're doing? And I think that's such a beautiful note to end on um, today. A huge chimigwech to all our panelists and to everyone who took the time to tune in uh, and listen and share in the conversation today. Uh, thank you so much. And if you're looking for more uh, places to go to learn, um, visit downywenjack.ca, visit 
the Canadian Roots Exchange website, visit the Orange Shirt Society. We'll put links in the chats and we'll um, link from our uh, website page as well so that those resources and education supports are easy to access. And we look forward to walking on this path towards reconciliation together.